So as I'm listening to this preacher kind of drone on about this text, my eyes get heavy. I'm that kind of a studier. When I read books, I get sleepy, all right? And so I woke up to the sound of my phone ringing, and, and I had that horrible feeling like I'm supposed to be somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I'm not supposed to be here. And so I ran to my phone. Sure enough, it was Beverly. Hey, do you remember? I'll be right there. I get in my car. I'm 15 minutes late. You know, that's how long it takes for me to get to my house uh, from here while I'm speeding. And so um, <laughs> I get here, and I run in, and I run past Beverly to go get this guy that I'm supposed to meet with. And I said, oh, Beverly, I'm so sorry. I was studying, and I went right past her. Is that true? Well, kind of. And it makes me look a whole lot better than if I had said, oh, I was sleeping. Anybody do this? We usually try to form the truth so it makes us look the best that we can. Anybody guilty of this? Don't lie now. Come on now. Yeah. So I bust past her. I get the guy that I'm going to meet with. I sit down with him. I'm talking to him. We're having a great time. We had a great meeting. And then the Holy Spirit says, Mark, you blew it. Remember we spent all that time praying and talking the last couple of days? You're going to really let this go? Because this is all a part of you being less like old you and more like me. You going to deal with this? You know, and I'm like, oh, get, come on. <laughs> but I knew I was, I mean, I knew I was supposed to. So I walked out. How humbling is this? She's my admin. I love her to death. She's, she's, you know, a sweetheart, but she's my admin. I'm her boss. In, in the world's view of things, I don't owe her an, expl an explanation at all. I hadn't told a complete lie. But I sat down in the chair and I said, all right, listen, Beverly, i got to tell you something. And she's starting to go through all the things that I had to do that day. She's, she's you know, let's get to work. And I'm like, no, seriously, just a second. When I came in, I told you that I, you know, I was studying, and that was partially true, but here's the real deal. When you called me, I'd fallen asleep, and, and I'm, I'm embarrassed by that. I didn't want to tell you that because I, 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 I worry that you're going to think that I'm always sleeping when I'm not here, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's not the case, but that was my fear, so I, I didn't tell you the whole truth. I'm sorry for that, and I'll try to be more truthful in the future. And Barry was like, well, okay, great. Now here's what you have to do for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> but that was an important point in my life. Those are the victories that God wants us to have, those, those moments where we understand what it is to be sanctified, to, to continue in this process of becoming holy. First Peter says, listen, be holy as your God in heaven is holy. Be holy as God is holy. Is that a pretty high bar? Is anybody there? Anybody just punching out, you know, 100% days on that stuff? No, we're all, but listen, as a body of Christ, we need to remember that that's what we've been called to. This isn't our church, and as a church, we are meant to be holy, set apart. These Corinthians were not being holy. These Baylifers, some of us, are not being holy. Look at me, church. We're killing the cause of Christ if we're going out there and not being holy. We can't keep dragging his name through the ditches that we inhabit because of our nasty sin choices and expecting this to be okay. This is serious stuff. People are going to hell because they look at Christians and they say no difference at all. We can't live this way. We're set apart. We're meant to be holy. And our example matters. We need to remember that. Third thing is this. We need to remember that every church is part of every church. We're going to get into this more next week, but just real quick, he puts it in here, and I want to mention it. He says, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Uh, Paul is kind of calling in uh, the reserves. He says, hey, just don't, don't forget that you're, you're a part of something way bigger than the church in Corinth. You're a part of the church universal, and we're all on the same team. Here's what happens a lot of times in cultures like ours uh, where we're competitive. We're, we're kind of centered on the American ideal. I didn't know if you know there's a hockey game today. Uh, you know, but uh, uh, earlier this morning, uh, Brad's Canadian. There was a couple guys who came running through the uh, auditorium while we were practicing, waving the American flag and yelling USA, USA. <laughs> I thought that was a nice touch. <laughs> you know, welcome all you Canadians. Anyway, uh, but we're kind of we're kind of created around that ideal. We're, we're competitive. We want to we want to you know win, and that can translate into our church lives. 
When I got here, I had a conversation with a person who I think is no longer here, and it was really important to him that Bay Life Church was the best church in Brandon. Now, understand, I want us to be the best church that we can be, but I don't want us to be the best church that we can be so we can beat all the other churches. Because we're all on the same team. When I used to play basketball, one of the worst plays in basketball is when two guys would be hustling their brains out, they'd go up for the same ball and a rebound, and because they're, they're trained, that if anybody touches that ball, you rip their arms off, they would start yanking and tugging and yanking and tugging. But they wouldn't realize they were yanking and tugging against the guy on their team. Two guys from the same team holding the same ball. And everybody, you know, I remember if I wasn't in the fracas, I would, I would with the rest of my teammates, be like, same team, same team, same team! So that these guys would realize one of them needs to let go. Because if you don't let go in that situation, if you don't know the game of basketball, you're going to get called for traveling. And so the ball that you fought so hard to retrieve is going to be given back to the other side. Listen, when churches fight with each other for the same ball, the other team wins. We are not a part of some competition between churches. We pray for the people who go to the crossing, the people who go to Bell Shoals, the people who go to First Baptist, the people who go to any church that honors the name of Jesus Christ, they're on our team. And we're about the whole winning. So, we'll talk more about that later. Some, someone stuck a pin in me. Here we go. Now, here's a question. What if I'm blowing it in these areas? Anybody ever read something in the Bible and been like, oh, and this is just kicking my tail. I'm not holy. I think this church is all about me. I'm the guy who comes in with cards so I can put ratings on things. Like that song, Brad, that was about a seven. Don't know that song at all. Here, it's about a two. Uh, you know, uh, I'm the guy who's out there, and whenever conversations come up with other Christians, I try to tell them why Bay Life's a lot better than where they go. Oh, you, ever, you ever read the Bible and be like, oh, I'm a loser? What do you do in those situations? Look at the next verse. What's it say? Grace. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Isn't that great? Paul throws that in every one of his letters. I think he does it because he knows what he's about to do. He's about to just pummel most of these churches. He's about to just hit them over the head with a big stick. And they're going to come out feeling like, oh, Paul, I'm such a loser. I'm so sorry. He says, no, no. Grace and peace. This was a common phrase uh, that uh, he kind of Christianized. Most people would uh, start their letters with a version of grace and peace. Grace is, uh, uh, you know, this charis. It's the Greek word charis. And peace is the Hebrew word shalom. And he just said, hey guys, uh, if you're messing up, just remember, we're, we're all here. We're only here because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And without the grace of Jesus Christ, you cannot and will not ever experience peace. Those, that's, that's the order. Are you troubled right now in life? Are your mistakes weighing you down or the mistakes of somebody else weighing you down? You know, in your own strength, there's not a whole lot you can do in those situations a lot of times. But you can fall back on the grace. And you, when you look at and remember Jesus Christ, and you experience his grace, what follows is his peace. It's this peace that surpasses the understanding of mankind. There's no textbook that'll hold it. But it's ours. I'm out of time. I hate clocks. I'm going to give you the next two blanks just real quick. Look around at what Jesus is doing in us. Paul moves from talking about the past and what has been done in, in, in Corinth to what's happening in the now. He says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. An interesting, an interesting phrase. Because if you look like at the letters to Philippi, the letters to Colossae, both letters to Thessalonica, the letter to Ephesians, Paul would start, after his greeting, he would say, I thank God for you, uh, for you in all my prayers because of this, this, and this that you've done. I mean, these other churches, you know, they were getting good progress reports, as it were. But here in Corinth, ain't nobody hitting the mark. And so Paul, you can kind of picture Paul at this point trying to think of something. I thank God for you, and he's like, oh, man, what am I going to thank God for them? Oh, I've got to think of something. So what's he say? 